next speaker has a few visual aids he's going to be bringing up to the stage and uh, setting up for you. I believe uh, there will be no demonstrations of the HL here in the auditorium. But you have heard the reference, BHO or butane honey oil reference, multiple times during the course of the conference. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Contra Costa fire investigator Victor Masenkoff here today to describe uh, this process of making concentrated cannabis. It's a national concern. Uh, there are hundreds of people uh, that are setting themselves on fire, uh, severely burning themselves, and dying as a result of the manufacturing of concentrated cannabis. And we're lucky today to have uh, Investigator Masenkoff here to describe this process to you, uh, the growing trend both here in the state of California as well as nationally, and describe to you exactly how these cases are investigated and the ongoing public concern. So I want to welcome Investigator Masenkoff, who he will describe how these investigations occur and the ongoing problem that we face. He's our last speaker of the day. And as he is finishing up, uh, setting up, I want to remind everyone that we, we do have a, a networking uh, social tonight at the Marriott. It's just two blocks up the street. Uh, if you have questions about where it is, please ask uh, at the information desk before you depart. Um, the reception will occur between 6.30 and 8.30, uh, hosted bar for the first hour uh, by the California Narcotics Officers Association as well as uh, advertisers. So please take some time, stop by, network, get to know uh, the people from out of state. Uh, if you're here locally, uh, just drop by uh, so you can exchange your business cards as well as uh, if you're out of state, please come by and, and take advantage of uh, some California hospitality. Without any further ado, I'm going to uh, we're going to turn the podium over to Investigator Victor Massenbach. Uh, it's an honor to be among, I've heard a lot of the experts here in their field, and uh, it's an honor to be amongst these people who are really on the front line in, in dealing with, with this trend and, and the problems that, that we're already uh, having to deal with, uh, and, and now we have to deal with this rush to legalization. Uh, and now I'm really discouraged. I've been reminded what's happening in Washington and Oregon, and they're frustrated, and I used to... Uh, I primarily teach, uh, uh, train first responders across the country in regard to uh, residential marijuana grow operations and butane uh, hash oil operations. And uh, uh, of course it's a problem that's spreading across the country, but I always use Colorado as my poster child about how to completely screw up um, legalization. And, and they know it, and they have had to work very hard while dealing with all the impacts uh, of their initial legalization and then having to come back and, and you know, modify their statutes and, and their approach. And I thought, we'll learn from Colorado. And then came Washington and then came Oregon. And I thought, well, well, we'll really learn from them. And here we are, right on their heels, about to step into the same uh, you know, problematic area that they have. So very discouraging, but it is encouraging to see the turnout here, so I have to applaud the, the folks that uh, have the foresight to realize that we need more and more of this type of sharing of information and education because that's where we are so far behind the curve. We have fallen behind in other drug trends before that were uh, had you know some devastating effects. Um, the last one that I can recall, you know, a little bit about myself. I began my public safety career back in 1976 as a firefighter with Cal Fire. I did 20 years there. Governor Wilson then in 93 took 5% away from state employees for a year. And uh, so I decided to move on. I went to work with the city of Vallejo as a police officer. And then in 2008, the city of Vallejo went bankrupt. <laughs> and uh, I thought, darn it. But I, I, uh, I had enough, uh, I was able to retire from PERS. And then I went on to where I'm employed now, with the Contra Costa County Fire Department as a fire investigator. They have a, a separate retirement system, so I was able to double dip. Which I think is the responsibility of every good uh, government employee. Don't be ashamed of it. It's a good thing. It's good for the employee. It's good for the taxpayer. Um, and where I've been for seven years now. And so during my time with Vallejo, I did a lot of narcotics work and uh, was working there in a uh, 
pop unit when the rave trend did boil. And I remember going into 1,500-person uh, raves in the old Masonic Temple in downtown Vallejo with my sergeant, who was a seasoned narcotics officer. And we're walking around with these 1,000-plus kids going, man, kids are getting goofier every generation. They're sucking on pacifiers, the music, the hugging, the everything. Went back, did some research, and I realized right under our noses they were, you know, selling, using, uh, you know, uh, illegal drugs, dangerous illegal drugs. And I started to learn about all the designer drugs and realized that, wow, we are so far behind the curve. We who are dealing with this out on the street have no idea. And then, obviously, the parents and the community has no idea what, uh, what is going on out there in these new drug trends. And it's because of the Internet, right, um, which I often refer to as the root of all evil. And... You know, guess where kids and people learn uh, about the existence of a new drug, how to make it, how to get it. And by the time we realize, as first responders and community leaders and educators, about what's happening, we usually learn because of the devastating effects. Uh, we're so far behind the curve, they are quite often on to the next new trend. So as a member of the fire service in Contra Costa County, we... Uh, started seeing a lot of fires and explosions uh, related to residential marijuana growing operations and to butane honey oil lab operations. And uh, as investigators, we had to start, you know, we investigate the cause and try to turn the responsible party. And uh, the Asian organized crime, uh, well, like all bad trends, two trends started here on the West Coast. The residential, the indoor growing of marijuana, and the butane honey oil, uh, oil lab operations. And uh, on the West Coast, Asian organized crime pretty much dominates into our residential marijuana growth. So they had focused their efforts, they were buying homes in East Contra Costa County. And for reasons that I won't go into, they, these, a lot of these homes would catch fire. We would respond as the fire department and we were electrocuting, engineering, and uh, deal with all kinds of consequences. Uh, you know, our firefighters were being exposed to a lot of hazards. We dug into that. And we started dealing with that. Um, and then we had several butane honey oil lab explosions. So we, we started to learn about butane honey oil lab explosions. And I mentioned the grows because now we are finding butane honey oil hash oil lab operations co-located with our indoor residential grows. Um, and as, as much as they, it's been dominated by Asian organized crime on the West Coast, um, which for them is a multi-billion dollar business across the nation because they'll grow their bud marijuana here on the West Coast and uh, uh, transport it to the East Coast and sell it at a premium. Now the East Coast is catching up. They're growing bud marijuana that competes with California-grown, uh, West Coast-grown marijuana. So that's, that's stabilizing a little bit. But even now, the cartels are starting to look at what Asian organized crime, the money they're making, and we're starting to come across uh, residential grow operations with butane honey oil labs co-located um, that are being run by uh, the cartels. So uh, definitely, it, uh, organized crime dominates. The reason they're they're not changing what they're doing is because the, the legal portion of the market isn't even close to you know putting a dent in their profit margin. And I would assume that as soon as it begins to, if it ever does, uh, uh, the organized crime elements will, will take a different approach and it won't be pretty. So today I'll be given a very limited amount of time to, uh, to talk about uh, butane honey oil uh, lab operations. So I'm just going to touch, this is about a four hour presentation, put it into an hour. I'll touch on the highlights uh, about what it is, how it came about to be and as what the signs and symptoms of the, the operation is. Because, again, that's one of the problems. We're so far behind the curve. Uh, first responders, community leaders, parents, educators have no idea what the signs and symptoms are of either the use, possession, or manufacturing of this drug is. And unfortunately, you can go on the internet, you can not only learn how to make butane honey oil, you can get everything but the plant material, the marijuana that you need to make it, drop ship to your home through the internet. So obviously, you know, young folks, uh, even juveniles, uh, can get access to what it takes. They can figure out how to try to make honey oil. And, and it's resulting in a huge number that continues to increase. People have died. People have been seriously injured 
as a result of making butane honey oil, and it's only going to get worse, and, and we know that many more people will die and, and be seriously injured because of this trend. Basically, butane honey oil is simply taking the, the waste plant material from marijuana, which because of the huge increase in residential grows, uh, all the trim, right, it's all about the buds, so you trim the bud, the leaves, stems, everything else, uh, mean nothing, it's waste. It used to be hard for them to surreptitiously get rid of it because you had huge trash bags of this waste plant material you had to get rid of. Well, then they realized, and although the process has been around uh, the uh, extracting THC from the plant material using butane has been around a long time, it's only recently become extremely popular. Um, so now, those that, that grow the marijuana have the trim, they're realizing, why well, now I can sell the trim or I can make my own honey oil because there's a great profit margin. Um, and it is a very simple process. And as it turns out, the most uh, effective, efficient, easiest solvent to use to get the THC out of that plant material is butane because it's chemical properties. And we'll talk more about butane uh, a little bit later on. And the biggest problem is, as people, <laughs> adults, uh, our youth get on the internet and you know they try it's a very potent drug I mean as a firefighter my greatest concern is the fire explosion happening so you know that in California we've now legalized two types of extraction type 1 and type 2 I couldn't believe it when the governor you know I get okay type 1 I get it non-volatile solvents um, there's a safe way to do type 1 extraction but as a you know as a citizen I don't agree with uh, making that the extract available because because of the high THC content, all kinds of new problems that people have no idea about come about with, with that drug use. Type two though, extraction uses volatile solvents and these are hydrocarbon uh, explosive solvents that are used. And, and in fact, we had a bill, AB 849, on the governor's desk at the same time that our other bill that. Uh, legalize the, the commercial growing and extraction were on his uh, desk. And that was to, as we have these fires and explosions, we apply our arson laws. Sometimes there's an explosion from the butane gases in these labs and no significant fire. So 452, uh, section 452 of the penal code, which is a, a serious felony and uh, addresses recklessly causing a fire, wouldn't apply if there was you know, just an explosion. Uh, so, AB 849 got through real quick through committee, and it was simply to add the word rec or add to recklessly causing a fire or explosion, adding the word explosion. He vetoed that bill, and at the same time, signed the bill for type 2 extraction. Very frustrating, and we have had little uh, success in trying to get some types of regulation or even the attention of legislators to help deal with the problem we already have, serious problem, and the problem we anticipate with legalization. Uh, so I've given up with legislators, uh, I've given up with dealing with companies who distribute uh, uh, butane, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, so the most important thing now is to educate the public about what butane honey oil is about, what butane hash oil is. Um, and how to recognize its presence and, and recognize how dangerous it is. Um, so I, we've looked for, there are many, many people that are survived their burns, um, and we've tried, we've tried to find someone that would talk about their experience for the benefit of others, and it's been difficult because most of these people are severely, severely burned, disfigured, scarred, and they don't really want to talk about their experience. We found this young gal, she's wonderful, uh, she's from Yuba City, and her boyfriend, uh, was making butane honey oil at home, it ignited, exploded, and she was caught in the fire and was seriously burned and uh, ended up in the UC Davis uh, Burn Center in Northern California and she agreed to do a story. So here's the story and I think it gives you some... And pot dispensaries, but yeah. making it is illegal. And experts say it is happening across the state. In tonight's special report, Fox 40's Ali Wolf shows us how this crime is overwhelming first responders, burn units and victims whose lives are changed forever. Now we do want to warn you, some of the images in the story are very graphic. She was a bright-eyed 
young 25 year old with a big voice. But Cassandra Pratt made a bad decision that left her burned and confined to a hospital bed. That was me, the first or second day. Almost one year later, it's hard to look at. the single mother is surviving but struggling after a butane honey oil explosion last August. Now she's reliving those terrifying moments. I remember a blue light and then uh, just something exploded. Pratt was at a Yuba City home with friends making the drug. I still have flashbacks. When the explosion turned her world upside down. It changed my whole life. She can't escape the emotional scars and the physical ones are scattered throughout her body. Every time I can't open something, every time I go to pick my son up and I'm in pain, um, there's not one second that goes by I don't think about it. She's also filled with frustration because she didn't know the dangers of manufacturing the cannabis extract. For the last three or four years, um, we've describing the problem with butane honey oil incidents as an, at an epidemic level. The epidemic is growing, says fire investigator Vic Massenkopf. <laughs> Massenkopf is an expert on honey oil fires, focused on training nice. firefighters and raising awareness about explosions like these from Santa Cruz and Walnut Creek. This helmet cam video shows firefighters rushing into intense flames ignited by butane that seeped into the air. Consequences of someone manufacturing the potent drug. Honey oil is made in a, in a handheld extraction tube similar to this PVC pipe. Known as honey oil, butane hash oil, or dabs, the cannabis extract is made with a PVC pipe, marijuana, a pyrax, and refined butane, which is sold in bulk online. It's cheap and sales are unregulated. We are so far behind the curve. The vapor is clear, odorless. You would be standing right now in a cloud of explosive butane vapor, you wouldn't even know it. And it's extremely explosive. The ignited vapors from this small can of butane can fill a 1,500 square foot house. This really needs to come to a stop because people are getting hurt and killed. Jim Doucette is the executive director of the Firefighters Burn Institute in Sacramento. It's devastating and it's in people's neighborhoods, it's in apartment buildings, and you're not going to know it. He doesn't have the exact number of explosions and deaths due to honey oil fires because it hasn't been tracked. Doucette wants that to change with the public's help because it's affecting innocent people. It's overwhelming the burn unit. It increases our work to grade them out. Last year, the burn units at UC Davis Medical Center and Shriners admitted about 30 people suffering injuries from butane or hash oil. That's about one in 20 patients. It's a major problem. Dr. David Greenhawk says burns from honey oil explosions are often much more severe than others. Someone comes with 80% burn, you got somebody who's got a bed occupied for three, four, five, six months. Cassandra Pratt spent four weeks recovering at UC Davis's burn center, and she wants to come back one day in a different role. I want to be a nurse, a burn nurse, actually. The 25-year-old is looking toward a brighter future, rebuilding a life forever scarred, all because no one gave her this warning. It's no good. It's not my day. Just don't. You can die. Because of her injuries, Pratt may never be able to sing like she once did. Instead, she's using her voice to spread a message that might save a life. You're with me, baby. Alan Wolf, Fox 40 News. And throughout the month of June, burn foundations across our state are working together to increase public awareness about the dangers of manufacturing honey oil. They're also hoping to get support through legislation and stricter regulation on refining. And we haven't gotten that, and I don't. You know, we did, uh, Assemblywoman Baker uh, out of Contra Costa County sponsored a bill on our behalf to regulate refined butane, and it, it didn't even make it through the first committee. Strong opposition from marijuana proponents and the gas industry. And uh, where we know that our, you know, where we finally won the war against the traditional methamphetamine lab was the, the effective regulation of the precursors that you needed to uh, make methamphetamine. We wanted to apply the same concept to butane honey oil, but it's a little more difficult with butane because uh, uh, just to regulate it and not affect the legitimate user is, is very difficult. Um, and, and so what I did uh, recently was go to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, the butane that they exclusively want to use to make honey oil is called refined butane. It's refined because uh, they remove Typical butane has a safety odor in it. If you 
get a natural gas leak in your house, a rotten egg smell, it's there because a, something like ethyl mercaptan has been added so that you know there's a leak. You know that you're in the presence of explosive gas. Well, that ends up in the dope, messes up the dope. We can't have that. So, the Chinese and the South Koreans, being the enterprising business people that they are, um, capitalized and created this great market of refined butane. That's where most of it comes from. So they remove the safe deodorant, so it's basically odorless. It's a clear gas, you can't see it. Um, and then there's in typical butane or propane or some what's considered contaminants, oils and things like that, and they remove those two. So that is what the, the people who you know, want to make butane honey oil need. Um, and you know, the Consumer Product Safety Commission at first they knew nothing about it. I was very fortunate, I was calling around one day trying to get a live person on the phone. The director of the CPSC answered his phone. I actually thought it was an answering message because I thought this guy's not going to answer. And he says his message and, and he pauses. And I realized it was a live person. It was him. It was very cool. He answered his phone. We talked. He had no idea. So uh, within a couple of days, the the uh, CPSC investigator was for the San Francisco Bay Area called me. We got together. I told him what the deal is. Gave him a sample of butane, and off he went. It's been almost a year now with no action. And I asked, well, what you know? We're importing this product that's causing all this death and destruction. And there's a safety feature that they're removing from the gas. Isn't that CPSC's, you know, mission in life? He says, Vic, I know, I agree, but it's not on any legislators, federal legislators' radar. And unfortunately, that's how the priorities of these federal agents, small federal agencies, sometimes are driven. You know, and we have had no luck with, with getting that type of support. So hopefully, folks, we have quite a collection of people with either influence or connections or knowledge. Boy, if, if you can make that happen, I'll do. We'll do anything we can and bring to them the training, you know, the education, whatever they need, presentations to to help get their support. A lot of people. So the process has been around for quite a while. This extraction process, and everyone goes. We don't know why all of a sudden it's become so popular. But I think there are, it's a convergence of several things. One is the abundance of the precursor for honey oil, or this cannabis extract, and that's the waste plant material. So now we've got all these grows, primarily the indoor grows, tons and tons of this the plant material is available now. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, and in sim very simple terms, I mean, I think we're all familiar with marijuana, you know, uh, its characteristics. So. Um, the active part of uh, it, uh, marijuana is the THC, so simply by taking, processing that plant material with a solvent, and like I said, the best solvent out there right now, uh, for all intents and purposes, is butane. Running that butane through the plant material, um, because THC is nonpolar, nonpolar uh, substances dissolve, nonpolar substances, and semipolar work, and polar is polar. Um, but uh, it very effectively separates the THC from the plant material. So coming out the other end of your process, you're getting pretty pure uh, THC. And you know people haven't dealt with that before. So like you all, I, you know, preaching to the choir, a lot of people are making their decisions about their opinion, uh, legalization, or their opinion in general about marijuana is on their probably dated and probably sometimes not even first person experience with marijuana. But marijuana has evolved over the years, we know, to something that, and very quickly in recent years, to something that is nothing like what these people uh, understand to be marijuana. And that's that education part that, that we're struggling with. And again, we are, I think we failed miserably in that aspect. Uh, we should have been doing what's, what people are trying to do now several years ago. Because we knew the signs, we were already dealing with the impact of increased use of new forms of marijuana. Um, but in any event, so that's that's the process, very simple. Um, and and part of the attraction is the THC content. Um, I don't know, Patrick and I are probably about the same age. Patrick, you remember back in our day when we smoked weed, right? <laughs> you got a. It's okay. That's, got an ounce of lid for 20 bucks and it was leaf, right? It was the old seeds and stems and leaf. 
the THC content in that old school uh, weed was 1 to 2, 3 percent THC. Over the years, of course, you know, hybrid plants and, and you know, all the effort into developing the marijuana plant, now it's all about the bud, right? So we can expect to see an average of 25 percent THC content in bud marijuana these days. Plus, people are smoking more than what an old school joint used to be. Um, now, when you smoke a blunt, you know, typically there's a gram of bud in, in, in a in the blunt. So you have to, to equal the THC potency of one bud joint today, you'd have to smoke 16 old school joints. And, and, and that's, that's quite a lot. So think back to your, your days, right? I mean, I couldn't even get through one joint, Patrick. I don't know what, I was a lightweight. You look like you might have smoked a little more. Uh, not bad, it's okay. We all experiment in our younger days. But now, here comes butane honey oil, cannabis extract. And because of this process, very easily, very effectively, we can reach, you know, minimum percent, 35 to 40 is the crummy stuff that gets out to the street. And that's, that's another dilemma already in California, right? It's legal to sell it in a dispensary, but it's illegal to make it in California. Where are the dispensaries getting all this BHO? From everyone making it in their garage, all make, everyone making it illegally. Well, they're about to make, provide for some legal manufacturing, but all that illegal operation, and, and we've seen what happens when you legalize the, you introduce more people to the product, and people realize that, hey, I can make it cheaper myself, or go into business and, and make it, and undercut the legal side, and, and we know all that, and we've seen it happen. But it is not uncommon to get 90% THC content in cannabis extract, in butane honey oil. And that is extremely powerful. And so the THC equivalent, one dab, and that's the typical uh, dosage, and that's why they call it dab, it's one of the street names, it really is just a dab, equivalent of 64 old school joints. I mean, that's from go going drinking a beer to a bottle of vodka huge, huge difference, and people aren't used to people smoking that high of a THC content over an extended period of time. And I'll tell you, the first people, the people that are, now that it's turning out for me, because we're having difficulty in law enforcement and on the fire side getting the numbers. You go to legislators, you go to uh, support from different groups, they want the numbers. The numbers aren't there because no one is accurately capturing the data. On the fire side, the fires and explosions are getting completely misclassified as to what really caused the fire or explosion. On the law enforcement side, uh, first uh, patrol line, uh, line officers, they don't know the signs and symptoms of butane honey oil production or possession. And sometimes those that do, I mean this, an extraction tube, a dish, and some product, and some butane, that is a lab. And we use the same uh, Health and Safety Code in California that you would use uh, in a methamphetamine lab when you charge this person. Um, they don't see it as a lab, but it is a lab, and the data needs to be uh, captured that way. And the folks in CNOA and Haida know that fact very well. They're doing their best to capture it, but all the numbers are way, way underreported for butane honey oil lab operations. Um, but the first people who are, I think are going to, we uh, present them uh, this year at their annual, the American Burn Association Conference, they're getting overwhelmed and in, inundated. It has started on the West Coast, um, and now it's spread, they used to go to their, uh, the, the last conference they had just before this year was in Chicago, and the East Coast burn units are going, you know, we're getting these burn people with this and that and that. You guys know anything about this, what this is? And our burn docs are telling, yeah, that's butane, uh, honey oil, hash oil operation, explosion. So it's reached the East Coast and now it's filling in everywhere in between in the country. So it's a serious, serious problem to them that they've identified and they sounded the alarm back in 2014. And like, I'm looking at what happened since then, it's like nothing. Why aren't people, you know, realizing, you know, how serious the problem is and those that have the ability to make some changes and impact it, why aren't they acting? I don't know. So, it's the burn units that, that uh, I think are going to be the first ones. They agreed to form a committee to start accurately, set up a system to more accurately capture the numbers of uh, people that are coming in 
with the burns resulting from these uh, BHL lab explosions. The other uh, factor that converged is the advent of the vape pen. The vape pen came about on its own, but as it turns out, one of the best ways to smoke or ingest butane honey oil or cannabis extract is using a vape pen. So now you got these all over the place. Um, and so the convergence of, of those factors, I think, and then the internet, um, yeah, make it easy for everyone to, you know, everything you, can, you need is so readily available, so everyone's doing it, and literally everyone. I've talked to burn units across our jurisdiction, Contra Costa County is big enough to where we use three burn units. Um, and as I, I talked to, uh, I started with UC Davis, most of our, my BHO burn victims have gone to UC Davis and talking with them, uh, learn about how severely they were impacted. But uh, we also use St. Francis burn unit in uh, San Francisco and I talked to the charge nurse in the burn unit, tell she's an older gal, a little crusty, been around, knows what she's talking about, and asked her, hey, so what do you see? She says, well, you know what? We're still about 30% of our burn patients are drug-related burns, but it used to be the meth labs, and now it's all butane honey oil. And she said, the other no difference I noticed is the kind of people. They don't look like druggies. They are cleaner cut or whatever you want to say. And the ages. They're seeing younger and older. She, said, she says, right now we have a grandmother in here who was making butane honey oil that exploded on her. So, you know, a lot of people are trying it. Uh, and making the problem worse. Um, so the vape pen is a possible way to ingest it. And, and so some of the things that are important to get out early to the public, uh, if we're going to educate the community and our first responders, is what are the signs and symptoms? Of how is this drug used? How is it possessed, contained? And, and what are the items that are used to make it? So the most common way for, for the honey oil to be ingested is to be smoked. And they'll use a pipe that kind of looks like a bomb, but it actually has a, a piece of titanium uh, in the end of it, and they call it a nail, and you have to heat that nail up with a torch. You heat it, and then you place the dab of honey oil on there and, and smoke it. We're actually getting more fires now because when people smoke BHO, and I want to go back, so those THC content numbers, it, because the marijuana proponents will look at law enforcement and go, hey, you guys, are, you're, you're blowing this out of proportion, you're exaggerating, your numbers are bullshit. No, we're using their numbers. So they test for THC content, the dispensaries. Those are their numbers, 90, 95% THC content in, in their extract. Um, and then the, the, the folks that say, well, it's not that powerful. These are chronic smokers. These are people smoking four or five times a day. Yeah, it's not hitting them as hard. But for your average smoker or, or your, uh, your apprentice smoker, smoking a VHO has a strong, strong effect and a high that lasts much longer, eight to 10 hours sometimes, and, and much more intense. And you start getting about above 30% THC content, and, and it, it can have a, a psychedelic effect. Um, how are we on time? Where's the timekeeper? Sorry. I lose track to start. Thank you. Oh. Um, and some of the other paraphernalia. So these are referred to as jars. So uh, honey oil is sticky. So a lot of silicone products are, very, are what they use. Uh, so this is the most common way that the, uh, not only the user uh, packages their honey oil in these silicone jars, containers. It can be a square, it can be a ball. Um, but all, even uh, the distributors, those that sell, will often use these. Uh, silicone pads, uh, you might typically see them for cooking. Um, they're predominantly used for users and, and, and in most part by those that make it uh, to, to work the product. Edibles though, and we heard earlier about the problems of edibles in other states, you know, our poison control centers in Colorado and these other states, and already in California, are getting inundated with calls from people who are quote-unquote overdosing um, on edibles that are uh, contain cannabis extract, the honey oil. Um, and so, like you've already learned, the edibles, that, that cannabis extract can be put in any type of edible. So we're having problems with, it's in candy, kids are grabbing it. People who don't even realize there's a, you know, there's extract in there are thinking it's just normal candy, cookie, brownie, whatever it is. And then there, there are those that are inexperienced, you know, dosing with an edible um, is very different from smoking. When you smoke, you kind of get the dosage that you took and there's a fairly immediate effect. With edibles, it takes time. So people that aren't familiar with it are, okay, 
They ate whatever, hmm, 10, 15 minutes, I'm not feeling anything. This is weak stuff, or I didn't eat enough. Boom, take another, take another. Then it all hits, and then they feel like they're dying, they're overdosing, and we're responding out there. Our medics are seeing that. Poison control centers are getting those calls. So that's a real problem with, with edibles too. And for our firefighters, we used to joke about, we'd go into these grow fires, and we'd joke about having the munchies and being real happy when we come out of there. But in Colorado, they're actually already having, some of these storefronts are warehousing these edibles, you know, in great quantity. And so now they're reducing the quantity that they can store. But when they were having fires, the amount of THC in the smoke from the fire was, was a serious health hazard to the firefighters and any other first responders. Who'd have thought? <laughs> um, so and it's familiar, yeah, it's good to know what the street names are. So it's all honey oil, but it, based on whether it's been further refined and how it was uh, specifically made, it takes different forms. It can be very hard, like peanut brittle, uh, that's called a shatter, it can be soft and buttery, it can be waxy, it's all cannabis extract. Um, and then th these are just some of the common names. Um, oil is very popular and dab. 710 is extremely popular. What is 710? 710 is simply oil upside down and backwards. Now where 420 became the marijuana holiday, that's why 710 is now the uh, honey oil holiday. And a lot of the good knocks that haven't given up on the effort, I know, well, they, you know, first of all, you drive around, you look for drivers who have 420 bumper stickers, but more so now, if you have a 710 sticker on your car, they're going to be, they're looking a little more closer, and they can usually, they're finding these drivers are more often than not impaired uh, by marijuana use. The other thing that makes it so attractive, and we're finding ourselves, we're having to, because on the fire side we're dealing with it so much, we are qualified as experts in butane uh, ash oil uh, lab operations in court. We're now going to uh, uh, bail hearings and, uh, and preliminary trials as experts, particularly bail hearings. Even the courts, even the prosecutors in many areas have no idea what's involved with butane honey oil. And we're, we're going in to testify, basically educate the court, and, and the defense in some cases, I've had defense attorneys come up and say, wow, thank you, I had no idea. Next thing you know, their client's taking the deal. And uh, they have no idea that if you cut this person out on their own recognizance or on some type of fail, they are only just going to go right back out into business. Because, number one, most of these people are users. And uh, what I started to say is, it is in the burn units that they're first starting to see actual, true, physical addiction to THC. And remember, that was one of the things about marijuana, it's not physically addictive, you know. But when we haven't dealt with this high level of THC, so these burn docs are having to treat the burn victims with Marinol, get them weaned off the THC so they can start pushing the meds that they need to, to treat the burns. Um, so they're going to be jonesing for more product because they're a user. Even though we took all their stuff away or it burned up or, or blew up, they can within a day have all the equipment they need and it's not that expensive and it's readily available to go back into business. They just got to get the plant material and they want to make that money. The profit margin is huge. A gram of butane honey oil in California spent, it can range from $40 to $80 based on quantity or quality and it can get up to $90, $100. Um, so if you just do straight numbers, straight retail on the street with those figures, $22,000 a pound for a butane honey oil on the street. That's a hell of a pro profit. And that's why a lot of people, not only are they attracted to the drug itself, but the profit margin uh, is attracting a lot of people into making their own. And again, very simple process. Um, I used this PVC pipe. They used to almost exclusively use PVC pipes. You had a cap on one end with one hole, and some type of a straining device on the other end, so this is just a cap with a bunch of holes. You packed your plant material into the tube, you put the top cap on, and so these cans that are designed just like cigarette lighter refills, uh, 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 cigarette lighter uh, refillers, they have a, a single nozzle on top, and you just insert it in there, and you press down. And that's one of the problems, it's not something you can just turn on and walk away from. And this type of, they call it open blasting, or I call it hand extraction, you have to stand there and push the can down to inject the butane through the plant material. 
So as you're doing that, you're releasing butane vapor. You're standing in this cloud of butane vapor that's, you know, just waiting to ignite while you're in there. And uh, and it's that simple of a process. So, um, but then they realized, well, we're putting this this uh, volatile solvent, butane, through the PVC. It's leaching all these toxins into our dope, and we're very health conscious. So let's not use PVC anymore. <laughs> And so now, most typically, what you'll see are glass extraction tubes, stainless steel, uh, and stainless steel is very popular. And so that's your basic version. Any larger scale operation of butane honey oil is just going to be an expansion of that very simple concept. So this one here is one we took out of a lab in Antioch. So it's just a larger extraction tube. They actually have holes for two cans. So you're going to stand there and you're going to dump two cans of butane, butane in there. There's a filter on the end. And like any other you know, drug activity, uh, it's like they all go to apprentice school to become journeymen and it's very consistent in how they do it and what they use. So they'll almost always catch the product with in a pirate's dish. And so those are one of the other, the other signs that we look for. China's slow. What's that? Well, no, I, I just think like straight, just without interrupting it, that would be the best way, right? Yeah, no, we're just. Well, I can feel it get cold in my hand right here. Oh, it's only right there. Oh, dude, we're gonna have such a huge yield right now, I'm telling you. happening daily in every jurisdiction across the state. We don't hear about all of them. They may be lucky, might get to receive minor burns that they didn't see treatment for or went into the ER and lied about how it happened and no one's going to interrogate them at the ER. Um, might have not required a fire department response. Um, these are occurring so much. We only see the tip of the iceberg. So many people are doing this. They are you know, uh, there are estimates that, that there's a 30 to 40 percent failure rate with this process. And so, and they're just very lucky that there weren't that many vapors out there, they weren't confined enough, that they didn't, it didn't result in one of these more, you know, disastrous um, explosions or fires. I'm going to zip through these. These are just what the process looks like. When it's out in the dish, um, that's what the product looks like. And when it's bubbling, it's still, so what happens Why butane is so effective a solvent is very volatile, which means at ambient room temperatures, um, it will immediately want to convert to a gas as soon as it's released from the can. And, and that's, it's good because they want to purr, get rid of that butane from the dope. Some of it still remains in, in many cases. So what it's doing there is converting the gas, bubbling. So even as that dish is sitting there, as it's bubbling, there is, there is a flammable, ignitable, explosive butane vapor being released. Uh, that's some of the other paraphernalia that you'll see, the pumps and ovens uh, that people can use to recognize that, hey, this is going on here, and, and then they need to know what to do about it when they do recognize the signs. One of the things that drives me nuts, and we talked about the availability of the butane, is this is a Sears and Roebuck, you know, all-American, bomb and apple pie uh, store. You can go to Sears and Roebuck online, you can get pallets of any brand of refined butane you want drop shipped to your house. It's that easy to get. But who really drives me nuts? So I went to Amazon, Amazon does the same. Wrote numerous emails, tried to find how to get a hold of even Jeff Bezos, every, anyone on their staff, the PR staff, I can't get a hold of a live body. 
And that's the other plea I have, is there's anyone in here who knows a way to get into an actual dialogue with anyone from Amazon about this problem, please let me know. And Because I have tried to get state fire marshals, prosecutors, all kinds of people trying to contact us. They will not talk about it. Because what I want to tell them, so I thought Amazon, yeah, it's good, you know, a gra grassroots uh, company. They'll, they'll understand that, hey, this product that you're distributing through, through Amazon is killing people, blowing things up, endangering first responders, and, and you'll stop them. You'll set a good example. They won't even talk about it. But what's the worst about Amazon is when, so you put in anything, the butane, any component of the operation, what do you get? You get that component, and then you get, well, and other buyers that look at this bot, <laughs> and you can see that. There you go. You can get, put any component in there, and they will suggest to you lay out every other, the digital thermometer, the silicone pad, the, the Pyrex dish, everything you need to make it and ingest it. I put crack in there, I put heroin, I put speed, I put meth, you get nothing. You put anything with BHO, and they lay it out to you, everything but the plant material, and I imagine as we legalize it, it's maybe you'll get weed on Amazon too, I don't know. <laughs> huge, huge problem, that's the problem of the availability. But it's also the problem of, you would think stand-up companies, people in the community, they don't see the problem or they refuse to do anything about it. So that, that's, that's where we're losing the battle. All different sides of it, everything you need. And what we're having, we're showing up at these homes, see so your neighbor, the condo next to you, the home next to you, and, and it doesn't matter, it crosses all demographics, real, real multi-million dollar neighborhoods, you name it. They may have huge quantities of butane that we're finding in all types of homes. So for our first responders, it's a huge problem because if it hasn't ignited yet and they're there for some reason and there are vapors that are escaped, they can ignite easily. They may be there when it ignites. Or if they're going there for uh, a family home fire, a residential structure fire, they're not expecting to find pallets and pallets of butane in there that's about to explode. Huge problem for us. Um, but these are the amounts of butane you'll find in these homes. And uh, we had a large explosion in Sunnyvale, so we had to, uh, or I'm sorry, Walnut Creek on Sunnyvale Avenue. And the, the city council wanted a presentation about what happened that week, so we went to, did a presentation. And of course, what was on their mind, they asked, what sort of bomb caused that damage? And I said, well, it wasn't a bomb. And, and it was could very likely have been the butane vapors from this one can. This is the most common size that it's distributed and used in a 300 milliliter can. And I explained to them that the ignited vapors from this can can fill a, four, it's actually a 1,400 square foot house, eight foot ceilings. It's a lot of vapors because this is so volatile, has such a high expansion rate once it's out of the can, and then once it ignites, it has an additional expansion ratio. Um, and so you can see, once you start to confine those vapors into one room or to one area, you, you have a very extreme uh, Explosion force. Um, and again, it's, these are the chemical properties. It just, what it basically says that in typical room temperature, it converts to a gas right away, produces a lot of gas vapor in almost anything will ignite. It. And I mean anything. Obviously, open uh, pilot lights, flames, uh, the arc inside, the parting arc inside a wall light switch will ignite butane vapor. Uh, walking across a carpet, uh, creating static electricity. That static discharge will ignite uh, butane vapor. We're warning our narcotics, our cops who are going in and hitting these places that your taser, obviously your firearm, your radios can ignite butane vapor. So it, it's, it's uh, very easy to ignite. And people don't realize it. And the, I talked about the burn units, you know, they are truly getting the brunt of this. Burn units are, are a very critical limited resource in any place in the country, but particularly in California. Our largest Northern California burn unit is a 12-bed unit. There are times when three-quarters of the beds in that burn unit are taken up by butane honey oil that, uh, victims. And those burns tend to be high body surface area burns, 80, 90 percent. And not too long ago, if you had burns, uh, say, upwards of 50 or 60 percent of your body, you were a goner, you were going to die. But our burn dogs, particularly in at UC Davis have done great work through. They're saving people now that have 90% body surface area burns. And not only are they larger burns, they're deeper burns. They are full depth burns. Some of these people are in that burn unit taking up uh, the resources of the staff because it takes much more 
staff to deal with those burns for a year. And I didn't know why I did a new story with Dr. Greenhall, who's one of the leading burn surgeons in, in this uh, country, who runs the unit at, um, because then we're all thinking about the, the, what's the impact of the taxpayer? He came right out and said it as, you know what? And keep in mind that we are all paying, most of these people aren't paying for the service, and it is a multi-million dollar stay, and we're all paying for it. Much less that that critical resource is not available now for the firefighter, the law enforcement officer, first responder who get burned in the line of duty and needs that service, or the, you know, the citizen who accidentally burns themselves and needs that resource, it is now not available to them. Across the board, um, I, when I was teaching in Fresno, I went to their burn unit, they had an incident where seven critically burned victims came into the burn unit at one time from one BHO lab explosion. And again, I, the, the burns are severe. Sorry, I'm zipping through, but here, 2014, I think this was uh, in Chicago, American Burn Association uh, conference, and uh, here's what Dr. Greenhall reported. The recent trend of using butane as a solvent combined with the widespread availability of print and video manufacturing directions makes this a significant public health hazard, especially in the young adult population. This is one of the leading burn surgeons in the country sounding the alarm in 2014. Again, significant public health hazard, particularly targeting our younger age group. And, and what are we doing about it? I, I don't know that we're really doing anything effective about dealing with that problem. Uh, I won't, you guys have heard all about that, but that is, that's a document that tells it all as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and again, we don't always hear about these. Here guys, the internet will tell them, do it outdoors where the vapors don't accumulate, you'll be safe. There is no safe way to make butane honey oil. These guys were making it, in fact, that's this guy's equipment here. I'm doing it out on the porch. Well, the porch has a little bit of a railing and butane vapor settled and ignited from the heat control on the hot plate where they, they'll put the uh, cake of honey oil on there to heat it up to get the butane to uh, evaporate out of there quicker, and but resulted in a, in a fairly min, uh, minor fire. But the same thing could happen, what it happened here, where you burn half the apartment building down. Or, which, this is Denver, Colorado, recently. Every one of those is a 300 milliliter can of butane explosion. Recycling the butane, no, if you have a leak, uh, like in this in New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico, this is a licensed, uh, permitted uh, dispensary making uh, VHO through a uh, closed loop system. This is how quickly things can turn deadly.
and, and we will see more and more. If you're, unless you're in a sterile, very controlled laboratory type environment with all non-explosive type gear, you know, switches and pumps and, and proper ventilation, we're going to see this even happen in the legally permitted um, site. So I'm going to jump ahead to. Uh, I mean, and winterization is another problem. We start having refrigerators blow up. Well, one way of refining the butane honey oil is you make it using the butane, you put it in a mason jar, you put um, isopropyl alcohol or Everclear in there. It's to, part of it is to re uh, remove the lipids because they're, again, health conscious. Lipids aren't necessarily good for you. They want to remove it. And you put it in the freezer. Freezer started blowing up. And we're going, how can this happen? Well, enough butane is still coming out of there, getting into the freezer, going out the drain tube, finding an ignition source. And in this case, blew up the whole kitchen. That imprint on the wall is one of the side-by-side -side door. There's the other side-by-side -side door in the family room. And, and we're getting more and more of these types of incidents. These are all different refrigerators that blew up. Um, how much time do I have? Five? Oh, let me get, uh, so this is an unfortunate incident. This, this uh, gentleman is now serving his time. Uh, in uh, Folsom Prison. I'm trying to work on an interview there. It's very difficult to do, but his two nephews, unfortunately, were severely, severely burned. Um, but he wants to talk about it. So, the biggest blast I've been to was in our jurisdiction of Walnut Creek um, in 2014, and so that's what the condo looked like. So this will give you an idea of the explosive force. Hey, Chief. You said there's a lot of butane in there, so what kind of Thank you for attending and have a good night.